<laughs> Greetings from the pastor study. We're in a series that I call Prepare for War, all about spiritual warfare. And if you remember, we started by having a real good look at the Lord Jesus Christ from Revelation chapter one, who he was in the past, the present, the future. Then we looked at as we transition to the preparation for temptation, we looked at, are we really in a battle? And today, as we continue on in this temptation, I want to talk about turning to the Father. Who do you go to when faced with temptation? Who do you go to when you're in trouble? I love the story that Paul Harvey told about a nun in a Catholic school who went into the cafeteria and set down a big basket of apples on one end of the table. She put a note with it that said, take only one, God is watching. At the other end of the table, there was a big plate of cookies and a student wrote a note that said, have all you want, God has his eye on the apples. Well, the reality is, folks, that we often think in those terms, we think that God can't look after all that he has to offer or, or to look after. So we don't bother him with the things that we struggle with, like temptation. And so we try and deal with temptation ourselves. And so often we end in miserable failure. We just don't trust the Father. In that time of temptation, we don't turn to the Father. And today I want to look at this third temptation of Christ. They aren't the only temptations he ever faced, but these are, are three great illustrations that you and I can look at and see how he was tempted and understand how we will be tempted. So see how the Lord faced those temptations and from that see how we can face the temptations. But before we look at the text, I want to draw your attention to three things. First of all, we need to understand that the first two temptations happened in the wilderness when there was nobody around. He was by himself, no one else around. And I think really that's probably when temptation happens the most, when it comes at us, when we're all alone and we're all by ourselves. In a, in a most vulnerable state, Satan comes in those private, hidden moments when, when, when we're hid away and, and we're all by ourselves somewhere. But this temptation, the third temptation, is going to come when he's in the midst of a crowd. And, and that really adds another dynamic to it. It's called the psychology of a crowd and I can say from firsthand experience that we will do things in front of a crowd that we would never do anywhere else. I don't know what it is, but a crowd, a group of people will bring out things that you would, you would never see any other time. And then the second thing is this. As far as I know, from what I understand, this is the first and the only time that we ever see Satan quote scripture and he's going to quote from psalm 91 and then the third thing i want us to see is what i've already shared from first john chapter 2 talking about the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and the pride of life and i've mentioned that in my mind these three temptations of christ really correlate to these three things from first john the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The first temptation was to turn the stone into bread. And, and that was to meet immediate need, to, to gratify. And, you know, that is the lust of the flesh. And then the second temptation had to do with the kingdoms of the world. You can have it all. You can have it. It can be yours. That's the lust of the eye. I see it. I want it. I'll have it. And now the third temptation is one that really deals with boastful pride, the boastful, boastful pride of life. And the interesting thing is this. <clears throat> you take this fallen nature that we have, this insatiable nature of pride in our life, 
this and it's insidious it really is it's awful and when you take that pride that we have in our lives and put it together with worship it just becomes insidious it is a terrible temptation pride in the place of worship has no place but that's what satan is going to try and tempt christ with so the first thing as we look at this today is that this temptation of personal pride often comes in the context of worship. Why is it that in the context of worship we are tempted to let our pride have control? Well, let's look at what the passage says in verse 9 of chapter 4. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a, on a pinnacle on the, uh, of the temple and he said to him, you are the son of God. Throw yourself down from here. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now, first thing that comes to my mind is, did this really happen like this? Did it really happen just as it says? Or, or was he dreaming? Is he having a vision or, or what? I mean, how did it come about? Because there's nothing in the text to indicate that um, this uh, this um, happened any other way than what the way it says. Did Satan have anything to do with Jesus going to Jerusalem? It says he led him to Jerusalem, and that's good enough for me. He's on the pinnacle. I don't know how he did it, but I believe he did it. Now, as far as the pinnacle is, I I I wasn't really sure what it was, so I had to to uh, do some reading on it. And I understand that from that pinnacle on the top of the temple, you could see the entire city from that vantage point. But there's one other thing here. And, and this, this really comes to mind about how significant it is that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And here he is a Jew. And that temple meant something to him. The city of Jerusalem wasn't just a city, it was God's city, it was the city of God and the temple was his father's house. On two occasions he went in and he cleaned the house, he cleaned the temple and he said, this, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. And he went into the temple on that Palm Sunday and, and it was during his triumphal entry. And here's the Son of God in the house of God and he's there to worship the God of all there is, God the Father. That temple meant something to him. But I want to tell you something because if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 11, um, I want to show you one little verse in Genesis 22 and verse 11. It talks about the angel of God coming to Abraham and having him stop his uh, um, sacrifice of his son, sacrifice of Isaac. Now, scholars say, and, and Billy Graham believed, that the angel of the Lord spoken of in the Old Testament is a specific angel, that it is a direct reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. Well, if that's so, then here we have the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ speaking out of heaven to Abraham and telling him, don't harm the boy. Don't harm him because he knew that one day he would come. He would provide himself as a sacrifice. And Jesus is standing there at this time in Luke 4 on the pinnacle of the temple. And he's looking down and he's seeing all of this past, present and future. And in that moment, Satan comes to him and he says, then we're back in Luke 4 now. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now, there's a few things I want us to see from this. First of all, there's an intoxicating high here. This first temptation brings with it an intoxicating high. As Jesus looks down from the pinnacle, he's on the top of the temple and he looks down and he sees all of these people. He sees the Sadducees. He sees the Pharisees. He sees the multitude of people that are there. He knows that he's going to have to to deal with, with what they're going to do with him. He knows what he's going to have to face from them. 
And he looks at all of this activity and all of these people. And, and, and the thought comes that at that moment, he could seize all of the worship. He could have all of that attention. He could have taken it all all of that control away from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and have it all focused on himself. Have you ever been tempted to exalt yourself? I mean, you know, tempted to, to promote yourself? I think a lot of people have. I think, you know, there's been times when, when you've had everybody's attention. You know, what happens, especially in church, when 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 you can have everyone's attention. Can I tell you that the status of that can be intoxicating? But there's another thing we see from this. It's not only an intoxicating high, but there's an inviting elevation to this. And I wonder if, you know, if the Lord had, had thought that maybe he could justify it, rationalize it, you know, just, I think that's what we do with temptation. You know, we try to figure out a way that we can turn it around and, and make it seem like it's okay. But I think all we do with that is to fool ourselves. You know, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we can sin and then rationalize it. But we can't do it. It doesn't work. And I wonder if Jesus thought in that moment he could have he could have, under the guise of presenting himself as a Messiah, revealed himself. You see, the rabbis taught that when the Messiah come, came, he would present himself from the top of the temple. And so here's Satan, and, and he's, he's in Jerusalem, and he knows what the rabbis had taught. He knows that this is something that is possible. So why not... Take this moment and just step off into glory. Now, when you stop and think about it, Jesus could have floated there. He could have been suspended by a, a band of angels. He could have called 10,000 angels, as the song says. He could have, uh, have had all of that glory, all of that attention on himself. But in that moment, if he had stepped off that temple, I wonder... I really wonder, would anyone have, have felt an acute sense of their sin? No, no. I wonder if, if anyone in that moment would have felt like they should humble themselves before God. No. And, and I wonder if in that moment, if anyone would have had a sense that they could, you know, that they needed to bow and ask the Father's forgiveness. I don't think so. I really don't. And I'm afraid that in so many worship services that the people of God have, have succumbed to wanting to draw attention to themselves. You see, pride, pride has to be recognized. It will not rest. Pride will never be satisfied until it receives attention. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, do we come... To worship, do we come to the place of worship ourselves with the context of seeing nothing else than Jesus high and lifted up? And then the second thing I see is is not only this personal pride, um, but but it, this personal pride begins to pit our agenda against God's agenda. Look at verse nine. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle in, uh, um, of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Isn't that exactly what the first um, temptation was about? And when he said, if you are the son of God, he, it's, it's a first class conditional sentence, which means that he, he's not asking if you are, he's saying, since you are the son of God, we've already covered that. Satan knows exactly who he's talking to. He knows exactly who he is. He says in verse 10, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And, <clears throat> and in their hands, they shall bury you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, here's the interesting thing. 
Satan knows exactly who this is. And Jesus has responded to Satan twice already by quoting scripture. And now here's Satan and he's quoting scripture back to Jesus. And I believe that what he's tempting him with is this, this, this sin of presumption. That, that he wants him just to presume on the grace of God. You know, it's it's a presumption of trust. He's saying, you're the son of God. Just just show everyone else just how great your faith really is and how spiritual you are and step off. You see, the sin of presumption really puts God to the test. And anyone, any teacher, anyone who gives the test knows that they themselves are above the person Who's taking the test? They have to be. Isn't that exactly what Satan wanted to do when we looked at Satan and how he was cast down from heaven? He wanted to have his throne above God's throne. Now, as we continue on, the second thing about it is that it wasn't just a presumption of trust. It was a presumption of time. So many times in scripture, we see where the Lord Jesus has said, my time is not now. Now is not my time. So Jesus is talking about God, the Father's timetable. But Satan says, you can turn all that around and, and have it to be your timetable. You don't have to wait on God for this and for his timing. You can take God's agenda and put it under your agenda. I mean, <laughs> How many times do we do that, folks? I mean, taking God's timetable and turn it into our timetable? That is presuming on God. And so then Satan comes and he quotes this passage from Psalm 91. And uh, look at verse 10 and 11. Again, he says... For it is written that he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. But over in Psalm 91 verse 11 it says that he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He left those four words off when he quoted this passage to Jesus. He left off in all your ways. I mean, it sounds pretty good, eh? I mean, I can do whatever I want and God's going to God's gonna guard me. He's going to protect me. He's going to get me through it. You know, he's going to step in and intervene in, 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 in anything I do. He's going to take care of it and there's never going to be a consequence. It really does sound good. But in all your ways is understood that we're talking about walking in God's ways. We're talking about walking in obedience and so Satan just manipulates the scripture and that's why we need to be so careful about who we listen to about the books we read about who we watch on YouTube you see this verse isn't a blank check for us to do anything and and then expect the, expect that God's going to take care of it God is not obligated in any way to care for you and to keep you from the consequences of your sin. But what the word of God says that is that if you walk in his way, he'll take care of his own. So let me show you the last thing and it's this. Christ countered Satan's temptation and he did it like this. He did it by turning to the Father. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 4 and verse 12. And it says, And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He's telling him flat out, first of all, that, that Jesus said, and Jesus said, this is personal. He's dealing with it personally. He answered personally. He didn't put it off on someone else. He didn't call an angel to look after it for him. He answered it personally. You know, you can find someone to cut your grass, to mow your grass, and do your driveway of snow, and, and even raise your kids, but you cannot find anyone to take that temptation for you. We have to face that personally.
Then the second thing we see from this verse is not only did he face it personally, he faced it decisively. Decisively. He did it immediately. He did, didn't dilly-dally, as I said in the previous um, study in this. He did it instantly. He, he didn't become passive. He wasn't passive at all. I think that so many Christians treat sin passively. We, you know, we aren't willing to deal with temptation decisively at that moment in an instant. And, and I'll tell you what, we have to, we got to deal with it right now, right here. We can't wait. We can't just put it off. We need to deal with it right away. And, and then the third thing is we need to deal with it directly. Look at what it says. And Jesus answered and said to him, to him. He knew where it was coming from. The temptation was coming from Satan himself. And then he dealt with it directly. But, and that leads really to the fourth thing was, was that he dealt with it scripturally. And now, folks, if you have gotten nothing out of this series so far, if you, if, if you get nothing out of anything today, please listen to this. Whenever temptation comes... We have to respond to it with the word of God. The Lord goes to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. Remember, Moses is warning all the people not to put God to the test. God tests you, you don't test him. He's God, you're not. Don't presume upon the Lord. And the Lord uses this passage that that is right out of this this life of Israel. Remember, they've come out of Egypt and, and God has delivered them and, and they're hungry and they're grumbling and they're moaning and complaining and murmuring. They're, they're you know, they're being critical and complaining. <coughs> and here God gives them chicken and dumplings, manna and quail. Now, I'm not really sure what manna is, but, but God gives them food. And then immediately, they start to complain. They're thirsty. And so Moses gets before God and the Lord has them take a, a stick and hit a rock and water comes out of the rock. And then in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 7, it says this. So they called upon the, the so they called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Can you imagine that? They 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 they, they just presumed and and you know presumed on God. They tested him. They test God, are you with us or not? You know, it's interesting to me that. And I think this is so critical that with every temptation, Christ went to a passage of scripture. Everyone dealt with exactly what the temptation was. How do we do that? By knowing the word, by being in the word, getting into the word, because that's the only place it's going to come from. You know, that, that comes from being in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, midweek, small groups, whatever. Being in the Word, under the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, obedient to the Word. That's when we're going to know the Word. When we're faced with, with temptation, we'll be able to deal with it. So as I close, let me say that that we all struggle. We all struggle in an area, and it's pride. There isn't any of us that don't struggle with pride to some degree. For some, it's overwhelming. It's it's an overwhelming desire to be public, to be to be seen. You know, it's a huge temptation. While others deal with other things, and maybe I haven't even hit on on that area that that you know the sin that so easily be, besets you, but temptation will hound you, I can promise you. And the only way to deal with it is through his word. So let me pray right now and in closing. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can open it and have you take it to our hearts, that you can speak to our hearts, that you can fill our hearts with your word. And Lord, we ask for that rhema to come. 
when we stand in temptation, when temptation hounds us, when we're faced with it, Father, may we have a word from you to be able to stand firm. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.